Okay, uh, very good morning to everyone. We are doing this course on the book of Hebrews. So we will continue from where we stopped in the last class. But before we get started, let's uh, take time to pray. Uh, would anyone like to lead in prayer, please? I just feel free. I'm not going to insist that any particular person pray. Um, let's pray. Uh, dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time and for this moment, Lord Jesus. This time we pray that, Lord Jesus, as we are going through this session, Lord, we ask you that, Jesus, you lead us and guide us, Lord. So that we will learn what you have prepared for us, Lord Jesus. So that we can equip ourselves, Lord Jesus, by your spirit, God. Thank you, Lord. As we are going to deeper in your word, Father God, let, let words should work and to be action in our life, Lord Jesus. We submit each one of us to your mighty hand. We submit Pastor Nancy to your mighty hand, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, I just wanted to check if uh, you can all hear me okay. All right. Um, yeah. yeah, it should be fine. So just quickly want to review what we learned in the last class. So we started with uh, Hebrews chapter 1. And over there we saw that... Uh, the author writes to a set of uh, Jewish believers who are persecuted, who are going through some uh, tough challenges in their journey. And uh, just so uh, they don't let go of the faith, he has words of encouragement and he also has words of uh, a warning to say that if they don't press in, they are actually... Um, in a vulnerable place where uh, their faith can weaken and uh, eventually it could even lead to them going away from the faith and so uh, he he tries to show them all the wonderful things about this um, salvation in christ jesus and uh, to begin with he started out uh, proclaiming the deity of our lord jesus christ so as we studied that first chapter there we saw that our God is a speaking God. We saw uh, the Lord Jesus and all the um, all the titles, the qualities, the character which is attributed to Him. We uh, also observed that uh, you know the angels who might have been uh, a set of um, let's say. You know some some category of of heavenly beings that people of those times uh, worshipped. He was also trying to um, emphasize on the fact that that practice was not a godly practice. And uh, in in the true sense, angels are but spirits. They are heavenly beings, but they are created and they are subject to the lordship of our um, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so even the angels worship the Lord Jesus. That's another point that he made. Uh, and we saw how there is this whole harmony in the Godhead uh, and, and not just the synchrony and um, the uh, interaction, honorable interaction within the Godhead, but we saw the honor that the Father actually places on the Son. So it shows us a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus and uh, it, it helps us understand in the Gospels, particularly in the book of John, we see many claims of Jesus, the I am claims where Jesus says, I am uh, the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. So he's claiming deity. Uh, I am even before Abraham was. So he's claiming deity by himself. And here the writer of uh, the Hebrews is 
attributing deity to the Lord Jesus and he makes, uh, he substantiates his point. He shares so many uh, reasons why the Lord Jesus is exalted and uh, that really enlightened us to worship him and to honor and glorify him. So uh, chapter one as such, it talks about the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we have to remember that the letter the letters uh, of the Bible or the passages in the Bible, they were written by authors and they did not necessarily classify them into uh, verses. That is for our convenience. You know, that was done uh, later on. So in one, you could take it as the writer of the Hebrews wanted to convey uh, the greatness of our Lord Jesus. But then he has these sections where he emphasizes that the Lord Jesus is this and the Lord Jesus is, uh, a, a, you know, he has other attributes. So we will find that the writing, um, now that somebody has classified it as chapters and verses, they will have a singular theme in most of the places. So chapter one, as such, the singular theme is the Lord Jesus as deity. Uh, so that we have established. Now coming to chapter two, the primary thought that we will see here is the fact that he was fully human. He was human. So in Christology, we talk about this beautiful mystery that the Lord Jesus is fully man and he is fully God. So fully God that we have discussed, fully man is the part that the author will come to. So chapter two, we started off in the last class he established that the Lord Jesus is great and he is God and therefore take everything seriously. What the message he brought or what he said, take it seriously. He uh, insists on that. So he read something like, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. So it's also an encouragement for us as believers. We are journeying through, um, uh, you know, this faith journey is, is going on. And uh, many times our tendency is to think, when I, when I was born again, I learned so many things about God. I was excited. I was on fire for God. Or we can point out, certain seasons of our lives where we may say, oh, that was a, a, a great height that I achieved in my spiritual work. And then, you know, we, we keep those as memories, but we don't really refresh uh, the truth to ourselves over and over again. But there is a necessity. You see what the author is saying? He's saying you must give the more earnest heed to the things He's saying we have heard, or we can say this about the truth that we have also heard, the salvation we have experienced, whatever we have learned about God. It's not like we learned it and we put it away and then we move on. Not It doesn't work like that. We've learned it, we have lived, we have worshipped the Lord with that truth which we have learned. But here is the reality, the Christian work. We can't discard it. We have to keep going back to many of those uh, truths uh, and refresh ourselves. So give the more earnest heed to the things which you have heard, the things which we have heard, the writer says. So to refresh ourselves, to keep ourselves um, fired up in the Lord at all times, even with the things that we have learned in the Past. So that is his uh, urge to these believers. And what is the risk of not doing that? What is the risk of not being fired up and passionate and you know remaining current with the with the with the word of God? He says the risk is there is a probability to drift away, and we discussed that you know a, a ship which is not anchored, uh, the drifting doesn't happen suddenly. Suddenly, the ship was here and now it is so many nautical miles away. No, it doesn't happen like that. It happens more, more uh, subtly. And that is the reality when we talk to uh, or we, we know of uh, instances where people have gone away from God. It has not happened in one day. It's very subtle. 
and it can also be very slow and gradual where the person is not realizing that the drifting is happening so you see there are all these dangers so our christian walk has to be um, a, a walk with initiative at all times we need some initiative the moment we say ha let me relax let me you know i've seen it all done it all when we have that kind of an attitude it puts us puts us at risk of something known as drifting away but in the christian journey there's only one way uh, and that is the way forward and one needs to be pressing in okay i'm not talking about uh, you know uh, all your human effort and uh, you know through works to to walk with the lord that's that's not the point but it's more like how jeremiah says seek the lord and you will find him so there is a place for taking that initiative and in our faith journey at all points we need to have that initiative there should be not a single point where we say okay now i have graduated so you know let me just relax and not do anything about my faith or my worship but at all times we are at the edge of the seat where we are excited we are passionate and that is the attitude which will prevent what you know we are discussing the drifting away so be warned take the most uh, uh, give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest we drift away and so he goes on and he says you know if uh, there was um, punishment or consequence to disobedience to the word which angels gave and i clarified to us in the last class angels doesn't mean the spirit beings heavenly beings angels because that word is um, translated as messenger okay, from the greek angelos so messenger can also be a human person and we know that the law to the children of israel came through moses the messenger and uh, he is reminding them look even the message that was um, handed over to moses that had serious consequences for disobedience so how is it that we can neglect the word or the message that has come directly to us remember we said um, something like the picture of the sun and the ray of the sun the, so the lord jesus he's the radiance of the father he's expressing the father he's bringing a message uh, of revealing the father to us and when he has done all this directly so to speak how can we neglect it when neglecting a message that has been brought you know so called indirectly had its consequences so he's alerting people and saying please don't take it lightly don't take your faith lightly don't take this walk of obedience lightly at any point um and so uh, he is adding words of warning there verse 3 where he says how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation you know it's like him emphasizing again and again what has been given to us is wonderful it's a treasure wake up um uh, don't think that it's it's something simple it's not uh, god has handed over uh, a a very very you know Uh, like priceless priceless salvation into our hands so he says so great a salvation just in understanding what the salvation is um you know we we will be we will be amazed oh wow this is the kind of salvation that the lord jesus has brought for us and it is in our hands so this attitude of neglect you know yeah i am a believer i can now go to heaven it's fine that's all this whole walk is about that's uh it in a way it's it's a very um uh, you could say irreverent irreverent attitude uh that attitude doesn't have honor to the salvation see he uses the word great a salvation and he wanted those discouraged believers during those times to remember and even today as we a journey with the lord 
we may encounter rough patches where you know things are not going smooth or promises uh, have not yet see, been fulfilled or um, you know we we are going through some persecution some lack some failure maybe even some personal loss and uh, we may wonder is it really worth it uh, to to stick with the lord to to press on to the finish line but see here the author is trying to bring the attention of the believers to what is important. You know, sometimes you have to have first things first. We need to have priority. Okay. Um, the main things should be the main things. And so he's saying, yes, the discouragement is very real. We are not trying to uh, play it down. But shift your focus to what you have. And what you have is very great. I hope you realize that. How can we neglect it? How shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation. So the, the, the focus lights are shifting towards, yes, discouragement, persecution is a reality, but there is a greater reality. We have in our hands a great salvation. Shouldn't that be more exciting? That's the way he's talking to these believers. And of course, he says, which at first began to be spoken. Um, so how did the salvation come? Began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So, you know, we have all these prophecies in the Old Testament that the Christ will come. He will redeem us. So it was communicated through the Lord in many ways to us. And of course, the Lord Jesus came in flesh and blood and the truths of the kingdom were revealed to the people uh, many things were revealed to the people that's what he's talking about god promised god fulfilled in flesh and blood we had jesus with us and notice verse 4 he says god also bearing witness both with signs and wonders with various miracles and gifts of the holy spirit according to his own will so he's saying this life and ministry that the lord jesus uh, demonstrated before our eyes one of the salient features of the ministry of jesus is he taught um, he preached but you remember the bible also says that he healed he delivered so there was this backing by the supernatural upon his ministry um, that we have witnessed so that was the kind of message that the lord jesus brought us he uh, he uh, spoke the words but he also did the works and that becomes our standard isn't it we've talked about this even in the book of acts the lord jesus he preached he taught and he did the works of the father the supernatural works of the father and even in the book of hebrews you see the integrity of what we believe it's the same throughout the gospels yes that is the life and ministry of jesus the book of acts yes that is the life and ministry of jesus it did not lack power in hebrews first century believers it has been passed on the same way they continue to believe that that god you know, backed up the teaching, the preaching, everything by a supernatural power. So there were signs and wonders accompanying the ministry of Jesus. Now, one application point for us is even today, as we do our ministry, you know, all of us are called um, yeah, for various things. We have the grace to minister in different ways. Uh, but whatever that particular ministry is, here is something we can take from hebrews the lord jesus's ministry was backed by signs wonders miracles and today you know for us as believers it hasn't changed nowhere does it say that um you just teach preach forget about you know the supernatural works of god we continue to do it because jesus said you shall do greater works than these and the gifts of the holy spirit are operational today so as we minister one expectation that we should have is yes i'm doing my part god will back me up the way he backed up jesus 
with signs, wonders, and miracles. Now, that is an expectation we should carry. Now, I know we will grow. Uh, in, uh, grow into this and we will see greater and greater things happen through our lives so uh press in press in and trust god uh, that as we pray as we speak the word as we uh, encourage release the gifts of the holy spirit something supernatural you know, god will do in the lives of the people that we are ministering to Okay, so uh, these are some of the points that we gain from here. So as I told us, uh, the author will begin to talk about Jesus and uh, reveal to us another aspect uh, about Jesus. So we are moving on to that thought now. Uh, so from verse 5 uh, to verse 8, I would like to request someone to please go ahead and read that passage, please. Verses 5 to 8. Verses 5 to 8, it reads, yes. It is not to angels that he subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet, at present, we do not see everything subject to them. To nine or to eight? Eight is good for now. Thank you okay. so much, Thank Thank you for reading that passage. So uh, let's see what we can gain from this particular section. Um, he says, for he has not put the world to come, of which we speak in subjection to angels. So you know that again is each word there we can get stuck on it for ever. Um, because it shows us the love of God. Uh, as you know, uh, we, we read in the book of Peter that he himself took, he took our sins in his own body and he was nailed to the cross. It shows us how much God loves us, that he wouldn't delegate it to another heavenly being, which he could have done. He could have just asked an angel to come and, uh, you know, do the redemptive work for us. But, you know, knowing uh, the way things were set in place, God took it upon himself and uh, he came for us. And that one verse there, you know, it, it, it really pours out the love of God on us to think, wow, God would do this for me. God would do this for me. He did not put us, put this world uh, under the subjection of angels. We eventually see that he is, uh, the author is talking about Jesus who has the dominion now. So uh, let's move on, verse 6. But one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? So over there, there is, uh, again, these are all passages that have been picked up from um, uh, the Old Testament, uh, and there is reference to the dominion of man over here. Um, we've talked about it, you know, from Genesis chapter one, verses 26, 27, where, where God says, you know, uh, he, he gave the authority to man and he said, okay, subdue, subdue uh, the world, uh, be blessed, be fruitful, be and multiply. So dominion of man is is what we uh, see there and we know that in psalms 115 verse 16 it says that the heavens belong to the lord but the earth he has given to the sons of men so it's talking about that what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him so even though man was created uh, by God, a created being, like many other created beings, something was different about, about man. We were made in the likeness of God. We were given the image of God. So there's some special, uh, you know, some special attention, uh, some focus that man has received. Now, he goes on, he says, you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. Okay. Uh, 
and set them over the works of your hands. Again, emphasis on the dominion of man, which we understand. But what is this point about you have made him a little lower than the angels? What, what do you think that means? You made him a little lower than the angels doesn't mean um, that we have a lower dominion. Yeah, yes, uh, say. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, were you asking a question or you, you, you're just making a comment? Man. It's a question. Oh, because I was going to also ask that question uh, because uh, most of all the translations say angels and then there are some translations that say Elohim. So, because if if from the beginning angels are ministering spirit to, 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 to the heirs of salvation, then I don't think it should contradict um, this statement should contradict what has already been said earlier on. So to an extent, I want to believe that this is supposed to be Elohim. I, I may be wrong, I, I don't know, but I, because if if angels are actually ministry spirits to to the heirs of salvation, which is us men, basically, uh, angels are, are not subject to us. Instead, they are actually, we are subject to them in Christ Jesus. So. I, I I want to believe it's El should be God that's Elohim basically, um, but I, I I'm still open to correction if <laughs> if it's uh, not the correct translation or um, interpretation. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm actually liking that uh, trail of thought. It's it's very theological because we are trying to interpret. Okay, that one portion of scripture. You're on the right track. Um, uh, so if if all of scripture shows us that we have dominion, we've already established in the previous passage that uh, angels are ministering spirits and they aid the heirs of salvation. So which means technically that angels are in a sense um, serving us, right? Or not in a sense, they are of course serving us. We are not serving angels. So that is established. But here it, it seemingly contradicts it seemingly contradicts. So uh, that's how far we've come in our uh, discussion. And what Say is saying is, uh, I'll just quickly go to it. Yeah. So Say is saying uh, in some places it is called Elohim. So now that thought, uh, say, I wouldn't agree with you. Okay, so I would go, I, I, I wouldn't agree with you simply because uh, when you look up the text, um, I, I, I once again just double checked uh, the Greek word there, it is angelos, it is not Elohim. So we can't change the original text. We, we know that angels are subject to us, that, that much we understood. But the line doesn't say so how do we now ensure that we bring out the truth from it without changing the original text so it doesn't say elohim it doesn't so uh, that's where i'm disagreeing with you say uh, verse seven angel laws again it simply means um uh, angel laws uh, messenger so messenger would be the translation of that word so now again we get stuck because uh, uh, it, it's saying, from what we can read, it says he made uh, him a little lower than the angels. So we are again stuck there. So what is the meaning? Uh, yes, uh, say you want to go again? Again, I'm very, very open, but I just wanted to bring more perspective. So the Hebrew writer is actually quoting from Psalm, Psalm 8, the mm -hmm. book of Psalm 8. And I actually have my NIV version here. Uh -huh. um, there's actually uh, a footnote. So if you if you check NIV verse, some age verse five, it says that you have made them a little lower. That's the psalm is talking, David talking about men, a little lower. Now it says angel, but I see a footnote there and I go down to my footnote. It says actually than God. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, I don't know if there was a mistranslation when it was coming into the Greek version i don't know but the original text from which the hebrew writer is actually quoted from is psalm 8 this particular mm -hmm. thing yeah so, so I, I, I don't know. yeah 
Yeah, you're right. Sum eight and uh, verse five there. The, I'm reading it from the NKJV. For thou has made him a little lower than the angels. Again, you know, I, I get the word angels over here. Um, uh, and has crowned him with glory and honor. Okay. So anyway, um, so I know I this was a little bit of a rabbit trail going off track just to uh, help us also try and interpret what we are we are studying. Uh, Christopher, you have something different to say? We won't take too much time on this. So yeah, go ahead, Christopher. Right. I was just thinking that um, um, you know when, when Jesus was on the earth, uh, he was fully God. And uh, he was also fully man, mm -hmm. and uh, you know this this aspect of fully man and the, this sort of dichotomy of of being fully God and fully man. Mm -hmm. That fully man aspect, I think, would have been you know under the under the uh, under the angels. I'm just I'm just thinking that that's possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you for sharing your thought there. Uh, Again, okay, I'm not trying to uh, negate your points, uh, but I'm trying to answer from what I know. Uh, and we've seen that, you know, angels are supposed to worship uh, Jesus. So again, that thought of uh, Jesus being below angels, I don't know if, if we can go with that uh, thought, even though there's that whole dichotomy of Jesus being fully man and fully God. So anyway, good. You know, we're all thinking together. Wonderful. Uh, we're on a journey. Yes, Shri Kumar, you want to add to it? Uh, Pastor, I was checking the original Hebrew word, which is used there in the Psalm 8. It is showing their Elohim only. Elohim. OK. Yeah, Elohim. Thank you. OK. Oh, is it? Uh, I'm also looking at it. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to clarify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just I was checking in the, in the Hebrew and uh, Greek one. Mm -hmm. So the word which is used there is Elohim, rulers, judges, divine, divine once angels is also the meaning where, but uh, gods is also the meaning. Mm -hmm. But Elohim is the word which is uh, in the Hebrew text it is used. Thank you, Pastor. That's so yeah. I just want to clarify. That. Sure, sure. Thank you. So, okay, fine, fine. So I, I think I kind of uh, um, didn't look it up fully. There were two words there. So, uh, yeah, thank you for clarifying. It says Elohim. Okay. You made him a little lower than Elohim. Now, Elohim... Uh, as Shikumar pointed out in the meanings that are given there, it does include God. And over here, they've also written angels, okay, gods. So uh, referring to heavenly beings. Uh, anyway, so we'll just come back to the point here. Uh, so when we see something which is contradictory to the truth that we already know, you made him a little lower than the angels, whereas we have established it clear cut that God has given man dominion and that angels are ministering spirits. The way we will interpret this is made up a little lower simply means that man lacks heavenly glory. Okay. Remember Philippians 2, even Philippians 2, we read about Jesus, God becoming a man. What did God do? He left behind his heavenly glory. But did his deity change in any way? No, it did not. Okay. So when we read here that he was made a little lower than the angels, the actual interpretation is that the heavenly beings, we saw that angel lost, Elohim, heavenly beings have a certain glory. But man on earth lacks that glory. It's just that. So we're not saying anything about uh, you know, man comes under angels and this and that. So that's how we would really uh, interpret it. So I, I hope it helps. I and mean, I just thought if we have this discussion, it will be uh, helpful in general when we are interpreting scripture. So, uh, yeah, so it simply means that man lacks heavenly glory. Okay, but we still have dominion, we still have authority. Now, moving on to verses 9 and 10 here, um, could somebody kindly read verses 9 and 10? But we see the him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering of death, 
so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Yes, thank you, Asha, for reading that. So uh, now, you know, verse 9, if verse 8, uh, the earlier verses are not clear, verse 9 can be very complicated because now talking about Jesus, it says, but we see Jesus. What did he say earlier? He said the angels, uh, uh, God spoke to Jesus and said, you are the son whom I have begotten. And then angels are supposed to worship Jesus. Verse 9 here, he's saying, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. Okay, so thank God we clarified it. What does it mean? How can Jesus now? It's literally like, what are you saying, you know, to the author? Uh, we can ask, ask him, what are you saying? You just said Jesus is greater than the angels. And now you're saying Jesus made a little lower than the angels. It simply means he left behind his heavenly glory while he was here on the earth. Okay. Now, if we don't get that point, uh, the, these passages can create a lot of confusion among believers. You know, we can flip to Hebrews 2 verse 9, see what the Bible says. Uh, he was made lower than the angels. But you have to interpret it correctly. Okay, so we got the point now. So he left behind his heavenly glory is what we understand here. Why uh, did that happen? Why did he become a man? Uh, so verse 9 says, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So when we study Christology, we learn about something known as substitution. Uh, that was a practice that was uh, 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 instructed to the, uh, you know, uh, in the temple, which is you, you bring uh, an animal uh, to substitute, to substitute the person. And that, per that animal is, you know, they call it uh, the sacrifice or whatever, whatever you want to call it. So Jesus became a man to do that for us, to become that Lamb of God. And in our place, He died for us. And see how beautiful it says, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So someone had to die. But after that, we know, you know there's this promise of resurrection that we have. Because Jesus died and he rose from the dead. And now we have the promise of resurrection. But he was willing to take that path, die, taste death for everyone. That is the reason he left behind his heavenly glory. Or in other words, God became a man. It's a mind-boggling thought to think. Wow, you know, we, we always think of that. It's it's easier to upgrade. You know, life is better when you upgrade. You get a better phone or, you know, you, you get a better option to, to commute. We are so happy. Oh, upgrade. But why downgrade? Unless you know, there is a strong motivation. And so Jesus was willing. He said, okay, leave heaven. Come to earth. Not so comfortable. No problem. Uh, but somebody, I have to do it. Okay, I have to do it. Taste death for everyone. Uh, and he loved us so much that, you know, as the writer is repeating to these believers, think about what you have, that God did not give this uh, ministry to some heavenly beings. He gave it to his own son. And his son was willing, you see, to taste death for everyone. And to suffer, verse 10, for it was fitting for him for whom all, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings made a little lower than the angels. So you see, again, humanity of Jesus, that's the emphasis, made a little lower than the angels. God became a man. 
that's the understanding now, what else uh, is he saying here he's saying he's trying to show us heavenly glory uh, and uh, his position of authority his position of lordship uh, whom are all for for whom are all things as colossians tells us everything that is created was created for him you know, everything um, is subject to him the book of colossians uh, teaches us that and again the writer here is saying think of this again and again god who is above all okay uh, for whom are all things and by whom are all things but he suffered he suffered he chose to suffer he chose to taste death he tasted death for everyone and over here what does he say in bringing many sons to glory so what was god's intention he wanted to redeem us you know we talk about redemption redemption is um, uh, paying a ransom or a price to bring somebody out of slavery or you know imprisonment or uh, some sort of a bondage what did jesus do he became the ransom he paid the ransom to deliver us to redeem us so in bringing many sons to glory and see how god looks at us you know, god created man in his own image many sons you see the way god is actually viewing us is he's looking at us as his children to bring many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect so who is jesus here you know he's the one who went ahead for us and usually we, we use those terms for the leader you know captain who uh, leads a, a fleet so the, these terms are used so he went ahead and suffered for us so that he can taste death for everyone and he can um, bring salvation to us and he became perfect through sufferings now we might ask the question wasn't jesus already perfect but you see in humanity that, this is why we say he was fully god uh, you know many things could have been given to him on a platter and in those times when when um, especially in the in the early church there was a confusion and that confusion was maybe Jesus was fully deity. There was no trace of humanness in him, which is why uh, some people, some philosophies said, oh, it was easy for him to uh, die. It was easy for him to go through his trial and uh, for him to resurrect because he was never a man. He was you know, all, all God, 100% God. But the writer of the Hebrews is trying to um, reiterate the fact that Jesus is fully man, he's fully God. And when we read here about perfection, do you recall, you know, when, uh, I think Luke, he writes, Jesus, uh, he grew in, in wisdom, he grew in stature, he grew in favor with man and God. So there were all these processes which were part of being a human being that he never short-circuited he also went through it and the sufferings right so sufferings obedience we will see it later even obedience there is a certain perfection which is attributed when someone runs the course you know someone um, uh, experiences the things that that have been laid up for them and in this case jesus you know obediently he walked through that journey he never said uh, hey, why should I? He, if he wanted, he could have. But we are seeing a perfection in that. It's not to say that he was he was uh, or not already uh, living a sinless life and all. No, no, that's that's not the point. The point is that willingness to experience and grow as a human being uh, and those sufferings which were laid up for him willingly he walked through all of that and which is why we'll see later he became uh, that perfect sacrifice for us okay uh, and, and this is the beauty of the humanity of jesus willingly he let go willingly he himself came 
willingly he tasted death willingly he suffered willingly he became that substitution price for us uh, and uh, you know he became here it says the captain of our salvation okay so uh, let us put our eyes on the lord jesus let us put our focus on him the reality of what one is going through yes that exists but you know we want to um, give our attention to who jesus is and what he has done for us okay so that is what we learn from these scriptures Um, yes, so uh, I think we have about four minutes. So let's just pause for a bit. Okay, Divya has something. To say. Yes, Divya, please go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no worries. Yeah. Yeah, I just had a question. Mm. Uh, when it says Jesus um, renounced or Jesus. Um, uh, like the heavenly glory, right? His heavenly glory was, um, he put it away so that he could come down as a, as fully man and fully God. Uh, so can you uh, elaborate on like when it's, when we, what it means to, you know, the, give away that heavenly glory? Thank you. Okay, sure. Thank you, Divya. So uh, the way we understand this is Jesus had a position and a majesty in heaven, um, which he left behind. I'm using the term left behind. And he came to earth. So when he came to earth, he did not move in those powers, Divya, because you know we, we've studied how, as a man, he needed the empowering of the Holy Spirit. In Luke 4, 14, we see he came back after his 40 years of fasting with power. So he came back with the power of the Spirit. He needed the power of the Spirit to uh, do the works of the Father. So that's how he, he moved uh, here upon the earth, not using that heavenly power which, which he had. Now, having said that, we also know that he was fully God. So there were instances where we see the uh, deity of Christ coming to the fore. For example, the transfiguration, when he was transformed. How could, how could that happen? Because he was still fully God. He never was, that didn't change. He was still fully God. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's sort of mysterious. So he left behind his glory. He came here. He uh, worked with the power of the Holy Spirit. But now that he is back in heaven, okay, after his earthly ministry, he has his heavenly glory back. So he didn't give it away. So we won't use terms like he gave it away or he handed it over. No. He left behind. And now he has it back again because he's up in heaven sitting at the right hand of the Father. So I, I hope that helps, Divya, to understand. Yeah, I, I'm basically I was trying to, yeah, it helps, Pastor. Uh, mm -hmm. I was, uh, like um, somewhere in some course, I don't uh, remember properly whether it was in Christology or somewhere we have learned like, uh, the omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience, mm. like those yeah, yeah, yeah. attributes, yes, mm, like um, were left behind. Is it right to say sure, that? Sure, sure, no, definitely. So when when I say heavenly glory, you know, many of these things are a part of it. The mm -hmm. attributes of God, uh, which obviously He wasn't, you know, He, he wasn't all knowing here. He needed the Holy Spirit. And uh, he wasn't omnipotent. You you could see that because if he was omnipotent, why would he ask some man to move? Oh, I'm so thirsty. I'm so tired. Please give me some water to drink. You know. So he left behind those attributes. Uh, but of course, once the earthly ministry was done, he was he's taken it back. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Then, yeah. Thank you. That that really help helps to uh, understand better for the entire class. And uh, Kennedy is asking, how could it be uh, said 
that the author of salvation was made perfect through suffering. So that's what Kennedy. I'm not saying that um, as deity um, he needed any more perfection, but it's it's emphasizing on the obedience part of living the full course of his life the way uh, you know it was purposed, and there is there is a beauty in that. Earlier we saw how by inheritance. He's the son of God. But we, we also notice that his, his obedience, his response to God was equally great, you know, which also makes him worthy of the honor uh, and the worship which are due to him. I hope it makes some sense. Okay, so Kennedy, do let us know either on, on chat or maybe uh, by muting the mic. Uh, but we'll go in for a break right now. And uh, let's come back after 10 minutes. So 10.01 uh, is when we will be back. So see you all soon. Thank you. <laughs> 